In Matthew 25, 43 through 46, we see a passage that has been used for centuries to try to scare people into becoming believers. It says, I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer to them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of these least ones, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, one thing is for certain. It does sound scary, doesn't it? And now you may be saying to yourself, surely you will not deny that this is speaking of eternal torment, will you? Let's talk about that. session we saw an exact picture of what the Apostle Paul and the prophet Isaiah proclaimed. Did God have to twist Nebuchadnezzar's arm to get him to bow and confess that he was Lord? No. The punishment was corrective. It worked exactly as it was intended. But now we're faced with a passage which almost surely sounds as if there is no way out of it. And this was the passage that we just read in the opening. But the key to this passage and getting the correct understanding of these verses is to nail down the exact context of the passage and the meaning of the original words that are translated here. This passage contains two very important words which we will examine. First of all, this passage was part of Jesus' most important prophecy given to the disciples on the Mount of Olives, chapter 24 and 25 of Matthew, and these are sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, a prophecy about the last days of the Jewish system of temple worship. Here in chapter 25, Jesus was giving a parable. From the accounts of the Acts of the Apostles all the way through the epistles of John, we see that the persecution of the church was not only undertaken by the religious leaders of the Jewish nation, but it was actually started by them. This parable shows how the rejected king of the Jews was now judging the, the nation and was about to bring an end to the Jewish age. Yes, those Jewish religious leaders were soon to be punished for their persecution of the least of these. It was a passage which shows the coming judgment of those who would persecute his beloved disciples. This judgment occurred at the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple just exactly as Jesus foretold. In this passage, Jesus was in the process of finishing up the answer to the question asked by the disciples about the timing of these events. So next we have to examine those two important words which cause fear, and these words are eternal and punishment. We need the exact meaning of both of these words to get the proper meaning of this passage. Let's start with the Greek word ionion. The Greek word for eternal used here in this verse is ionion, which has as its root word ionios. This word is also defined in Thayer's Greek lexicon as without beginning or end. That sounds like a good definition, doesn't it? But if that is true, then why have the writers of the New Testament chosen a different word to describe the eternal God? Yes, the word used to de describe God's existence in the Bible is a different Greek word, and that word is idios. Here is one of the two instances in, which the, in the Bible in which that word is used. The other is in Jude 6, but let's look at what Paul said. It said, For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Yes, this is a description of God's power and divine nature, which is eternal. But now let's look closer at this Greek word ionios, or ionion. First of all, this Greek word is derived from the Greek word ion, 
from which we see the word translated as age in the English Standard Bible, in the NIV, and most of the newer versions. Here's an example of the word ion. In Luke 18, it says, And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come, eternal or aeonium life in the ESV. Do you see the problem here? Luke is speaking of the age to come. The Greek word ionion is an adjective. It is impossible for an adjective describing a time period to be longer than the root word itself. If it is an age that is yet to come, then this word cannot mean eternal or everlasting. An age is a specified period of time. Let's look at another rendering of this passage. The translation that I'm about to use here is over a hundred years old. So this is not something new. We're looking at well-established scholarship and translation. From the Rotherham's emphasized Bible, we see, and then he said to them, verily I say to you, no one is, is there who hath left house or wife or brethren or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall in any wise not receive manifold in this season and in the age that is coming, the life age abiding. This rendering must be better on this verse than the English Standard Version because it actually makes sense. In Thayer's Greek lexicon, we find the meaning of the Greek word ion as used by the Greek authors is, first of all, age, a human lifetime, life itself. Two, an unbroken age, perpetuity of time or eternity. Thus, we can see that this word used in the New Testament is used in two ways. First, as an age that can be a length of a human lifetime. And second, we see that it can be used as an unbroken age or an age of indefinite duration of time, which would be up to perpetuity. But let's look at this from another perspective. For example, the first word we need to consider is the Greek word ion. This word is properly translated as age in most of our translations. For example, Jesus said in Luke 24 or 20, 34, and Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. In 1 Corinthians 1, 20, it says, who is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Next, none of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now, I have a question I'd like to ask at this time. Would anyone dispute the fact that the use of the noun age in these verses are periods of time which are not eternal? We have used this word to indicate a specified period of time for as long as we can remember. For example, what do we think of when we hear the term Stone Age? Generally, we think of a long period of time wherein primitive people used implements of stone to live with. During the 18th century, we have the Age of Enlightenment, which history records as a European philosophical movement centered on such things as human reasoning as the primary source of all authority. Then we have the Industrial Age, a period of time from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century when manufacturing dominated the world scene. Next, you have the Space Age, and on and on and on. Right now we're living in the Information Age. Do you get the picture? That's right. An age is an unspecified period of time which has a beginning and an end. This word age, which we are discussing, is a noun. If you turn that word into a descriptive word, such as an adjective, you have a word like age abiding. It cannot mean a period of time which is longer than the root word. First, let's look at how this word ionios is used in the New Testament by the translators. Here are the two renderings in Matthew 25, 41. First, we'll look at the English Standard Version. And it says, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 
Now here are other two other translations. First the Rotherham. Then he will say to those also on his left hand, Depart ye from me, accursed ones, into the age abiding fire, which hath been prepared for the adversary and his messengers. And then from the Weymouth New Testament, Then he will say to those on his left, Be gone from me, with the curse resting upon you, into the fire of the ages, which had been prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, over a century ago, John Wesley Hansen recorded the following words. Surely one of the gravest mistakes in the Bible translating has been the mistranslation of the Hebrew word olam and its Greek equivalent ion and its adjective ionios. To attribute eternal qualities to a word signifying periods of time in the original Hebrew and Greek has completely changed the nature and character of God and his plan of redemption upon mankind. More English translations in the 20th century are beginning to acknowledge this gross error and making corrections. Translations such as Young's Literal, Rotham, Rotherham's Emphasized, Concordant Literal, Weymouth's New Testament, 20th Century New Testament, John Mitchell's New Testament, as well as others, have rendered the Hebrew Olam and the Greek Aeon, Ion, I should say, with the words signifying time on earth and not as eternal or words signifying everlastingness everlastingness. Now let's look at one more Greek word that bears on this case, and that word is the word for punishment. That word in the Greek is kolassin, which is kolassis. Notice that what Thayer's lexicon says of this. It says kolassis equals correction, punishment, or penalty. So the word used here, kolassis, means correction. Thus, when we can derive from this that there is a purpose for the punishment mentioned in Matthew 25, 46, and for, that is for the purpose of correction. Let's read the verse again. It says, And these shall go away into the age-abiding correction, but the righteous into an age-abiding life. Now, putting this all together, we see that Matthew 25, 46 speaks of a punishment that is corrective, and can last for a period of time depending on the length of the age. Since God is sovereign, that means it's up to him. Do you see the profound significance of this? This begs the question for those of you who have children. Why do you punish your children? Is it because you hate them and want to get even with them for what they have done? Of course not. It is because you love them and want to correct them. This means that there is a loving purpose to the correction of God. God is not throwing these ones into a state of eternal torture that goes on forever without purpose. God is giving them a type of correction that will be lasting and will be reconciliatory. When they finish this correction, they will humbly and willingly praise the God of heaven for his awesome goodness, just like King Nebuchadnezzar did, as we explained in our last segment. Once again, I would like to point out that there is so much more that needs to be understood about this subject. In this short video, I've only touched the surface of what there is on this. So I'd like to encourage you once again to go get a copy of my book, God's Purpose for Hell, A Compelling Probe of God's Love for the Lost, which goes into these things in much greater detail. When we come back in our next segment, we will discuss a passage in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, which bears on this case. Won't you join us for this? Thank you and have a great day.